fearless. We're so happy to have you guys join us today. We're in the fourth, this is the fourth Sunday. You guys, this month is over. I can't believe it, this year is on steroids. And I'm so excited that you guys have joined us today. And uh, this month we've been doing a series here at Mavuno Church uh, called For God, For God and Country. Um, and so even as we begin, uh, I want you guys to turn to the person seated. And if there's no one seated next to you, you can write it uh, on the comments. Uh, what are you thanking God for? Um, what are you hoping for this next month as we even near the elections here in Kenya? We're about to do our elections. And guys, please pray for our country. With the hope of this nation, Christians, we need to pray for our country. All right, we're about to get into a time of praise and worship. You guys, are you excited? I'm excited. Yeah, so get up on your feet. Um, if you need to move your sofas, if you need to move some chairs around, guys, get some space because we're about to get down here. All right, Jojo, yeah. take it away. Right. Put your hands together. Jesus will lift your name on high, your name on high, be lifted high. You say, Jesus will lift your name on high, your name on high, be lifted high. One more time, say, Jesus will lift your name on high, your name on high, be lifted high. Your name 
God. We are so grateful for your goodness. We are so grateful that thus far you have brought us, oh God, we can only say that you are Ebenezer, oh God. That the strides we have made in this nation, oh God, the strides we have made in this country, oh God, it is because of you and you alone, oh God. We magnify you. We glorify you, Jesus. We lift you high and high. We exalt you, Lord.
love you, Jesus. We are so grateful, oh God. It's not a, th it's not a normal thing, oh God, that we could see the end of a month, oh God. But we are grateful. Thus far you have brought us, oh God. We are grateful as a nation, oh God, that we have seen dark times, but you, you have always pulled us through those dark times, oh God. We are grateful, oh God, because you hold us in the palm of your hands, oh God. We are so grateful, oh God, because you are Ebenezer. We are so grateful for your goodness. We are so grateful, oh God. Oh, we ask you that you will be magnified and glorified. That this nation, oh God, people will look at us and see that indeed there is a God in heaven. That they will look at us and say, indeed, God loves us as a nation. Father, we glorify you and we bless you in Jesus' name we pray. now 2014 and after nine years of existence, the Mavuno movement of churches is now ready to settle into a home of its own. The journey has been exciting but it's also been grueling. It included two stops in various suburbs of Nairobi's South Sea area, the South Sea Sports Club and later the Bellevue Cinema Grounds. It also included an incredible faith journey where the members of the church community committed to raise the astronomical figure of 3.5 million US dollars required to purchase and settle on a new piece of land on the outskirts of Nairobi city. And on March 2nd, 2014, after months of waiting on God, months of fundraising and generous giving, and months of planning and preparation, it finally happened. Mavuno Church held its first service on its global headquarters. But what was that early season like? Did everything go according to plan? Or did God surprise the Mavuno movement of churches? I mean, the times at Hill City, it was tough. I mean, starting off the early years of Hill City, uh, ministry at that point were really difficult. And there was a lot of challenges, whether it was spiritual oppression, the, 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 the spiritual attacks of all our staff members and our congregation were going through at the time, whether it was just settling the property, it was such a desolate and such an unoccupied place. The roads were non-existent. I mean, we had to do so much work just to make it habitable. It was a tough time. I don't think I'd ever gone through such a hard time in ministry. But you know what happened is in retrospect, the Lord was using that time to really just strengthen us and to get us ready for what He wanted to do. In fact, I remember just reflecting back on the book of Acts. Uh, when the church was in Jerusalem, it was such a cozy church. The apostles were there, everything was happening. And then God sent a persecution. And it was only in that time of persecution that they were able to go out and make disciples of all nations like they were supposed to. And that's exactly what happened to us. As things became difficult, we began to realize that, hey, God wanted us to go. And I can tell you, it was in that time that many of the Mavuno churches, the countries we're in, were started. I mean, it's hard to believe that by the time we moved to Hill City, only five Mavuno churches existed. Uh, Mavuno Hill City itself, uh, downtown and, uh, and Mashariki, and those are the ones that were in Kenya. And then Kampala, Mavuno Kampala and Mavuno Berlin. Those were the, the five Mavuno churches of that time. It's hard to believe it because in that time, then we began to plant all the other churches, whether it's Lusaka, whether it's uh, 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 Blantyre, whether it's Kigali, whether it's uh, uh, coming back to Kampala where there's Entebbe and there's 360, whether you're talking about Kigali, I, I think I mentioned Kigali, you're talking about Addis, and you're talking about DRC, uh, Kinshasa. I mean, it's like every one of these churches happened at that time. That's so exciting for me to realize that in the middle of the difficulty, God was birthing something new. In addition to all the countries I've talked about, churches were begun in different parts of Nairobi as well and of Kenya as well. And I really give God glory because none of this could, we couldn't even take credit of the, for this. It was God definitely at work among us. And I think I want to say that for me, when I look back at our story, this uh, occupying this place, was actually a catalyst that God has used to grow the faith of many, many people at Mavuno today. And I believe our story is just beginning. God has so, so much that he wants to do yet 
through us as a congregation. And that's why God's people, it's so amazing. We must be keen about freeing our future. I really believe that there's so many other nations we must be going to. There's so many other missionaries we must be sending out. There's so many other uh, groups that we must be launching across the whole world. And that uh, this is our time. And as we free the future, as we pay off the mortgage at the Hill City property, it's only going to give us the resources to go into places that we can't imagine. Can you believe it? In the next 10 years, we're going to be mentioning countries that none of us could even imagine right now that we'll have gone to because we'll have freed that future. So I want to just encourage every single person in Mavuno, if you haven't yet played your part, listen, we're here because other people played their part. If you haven't yet plugged in and uh, signed up to free the future, I want to just challenge you to do that with your family because you want to be one of those who will say, my goodness, in my time, I played my part and look what the Lord has done. More churches were birthed and more people were impacted in the years since the Mavuno movement settled into its headquarters. The ministry grew from four churches meeting across three countries in 2014 to over 30 different Mavuno congregations meeting across nine different countries by 2020. New churches of fearless influencers sprung up in Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, Ethiopia, Malawi, and Zambia. One of the very exciting church plants was set up in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the year 2017. With the exception of the German-speaking Mavuno Berlin and the English and Amharic-speaking church out in Addis Ababa, the DRC community was exciting because it began to open up the Mavuno movement to French-speaking parts of Africa. We packed our bags and headed out to meet their lead pastor, Pastor Freddy Sebuyange, just to hear what his thoughts about Hill City are. Uh, greetings, my name is Pastor Freddy Sebuyange and I lead uh, Mavuno Church here in Kinshasa. Uh, so, um, in 2014, I was still a student in Kampala and then I was involved in the ministry in Mavuno Kampala. And then the leadership of Mavuno Church Kampala um, asked us to join the internship in Nairobi uh, together with a group of, I think we're five or four, if I remember. And we traveled to Nairobi. I remember landing to Hill City, <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, by bad luck. I don't know if it's just bad luck. On that day, the rain was just incredible. Uh, it had rained, so there is no way we could pass by Hill City because, you know, I know right now there is a lot of development, by, but then even the car moving there, it was just uh, crazy. And then the following day, uh, when we now reported to the, to, to, to the office, Oh my goodness, the dust was just amazing. I've never seen dust in my life like that. Uh, we we're having a staff meeting and then, um, so dust decided to, you know, the wind, it came in and it distracted us because by then the office was just the tent where there is the Swahili uh, ministry happening right now. So, I mean, it was, um, it was amazing, it was amazing. So in 2016, I came back home to Kinshasa um, and then July 2nd, 2017, we launched uh, officially the church here. So many things started happening. We started translating all our discipleship uh, material into French, the vision into French. I mean, the journey was amazing. I remember by then I was single um, and I'll just be happy not even sleeping, doing, uh, facilitating five music classes every, every, every week. I remember after four months, we had seen now people, lives transformed and what God was doing. I mean, it was just amazing. And so um, 2017, the same year, I went back to Nairobi. Oh my goodness, it was just amazing to see the transformation, that, uh, the, transformation the, the change, the trees that we had planted. So it was amazing. And so guys, we are really talking about free the future, it's divine. For me, it's really divine. We have to do this. Uh, there, is no, there is no other way. We have to do it. And you know, we are talking about our HQ, our headquarter. So we must free the future. It, it, I mean, it's a must for us uh, because if we don't do it, when will we, uh, you know, buy something here in Kinshasa? Uh, and that's what we are talking about. And for us, we are really ex super excited about it because you know, once we free the future, we are able to now move on to other other things, other projects. Uh, should it be here in Kinshasa? Should it be in Brazzaville, which is next year? So, guys, let's free our future. I encourage all of us to fulfill our pledges, uh, which will be a blessing to us. And, and some of us, I know we are already receiving those blessings. So, God bless you. Bye-bye.
Well, hello everyone and welcome to Mavuno Church. My name is Pastor Edward Ondachi. I'm the campus pastor at Mavuno Church that meets in Lovington. It's my pleasure to be able to bring to you the fourth and final part of our series in March called For God and Country. We have been profiling the country that we love so much, the country of Kenya, and looking through the book of Esther to see how can we align what our country is going through right now and going to the elections on August the 9th this year with what has been happening in this book. Some of you have been asking, why are you doing a series on politics? The idea, friends, the object of this series is to educate us, to challenge us, and to rally every citizen in our country to see Kenya as a gift from God and to be able to pray as is our duty for Kenya and to participate in our politics even as we do that. Now, every five years, our country goes through an experience very, very close to political heart surgery. Tensions as high as political rhetoric of the most dangerous kind dominates the airwaves and as we watch news every evening, tensions are getting higher and higher. I don't know how things are where you are right now, but maybe you're aligning yourself in some way to these elections. Maybe you're disgusted by everything that you're seeing. I don't know how you are praying, but we need to recognize that while this electioneering has built and expanded Kenya's democratic space, we have also lost lives. We have lost lives. And our, our, our development has slowed down in so many ways because during an election year, we lose a whole year of business and sometimes even two. Investors leave, the they stocks drop, and things just come to a standstill. God has often been relegated to the back burner as the country has been sacrificed as the altar of tribal tensions. What will Kenya's legacy be as we look to the national elections of 2022? The book of Esther was written in 4 BC, and it carries themes and exploits strangely similar to what Kenya goes through every five years. There was a queen who was deposed of her job. There was a conspiracy that was exposed. There was a tribe that was discriminated. And, and then there was a, a, a genocide that was orchestrated, that was so, so dangerous. Uh, this book really reads like a modern day blockbuster. This much, we want to mirror the book of Esther with Kenya and see what lessons we can glean from this book. We finished last week's sermon by profiling Mordecai. Mordecai really is the superstar of the book of Esther. Because of his bravery, because of his convictions to stand on his faith, persecution and ultimate deliverance came on his people. God loves it when his children stand strong in the face of persecution. It really does make God very, very proud. The Bible says this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. The Bible says, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. Let me explain what that means. It means whatever you're going through as a Christian, there are people who are watching for your bravery. It says strengthen yourself, square yourself out, because there are people whose backs need to be strengthened because yours and mine are strengthened. We have a watching audience who are waiting to see how we respond in the face of trial so that they too can stand. God is proud of us when we stand and engage in spiritual warfare. It is our anointing and it is our call. Today, as we wind up this book, we're going to look at the book of Esther chapter 4 from verse 1 to verse 17. The title of today's message is A Christian for Such a Time as This. Verse 1 of chapter 4, it says this, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, that is what Haman had decided and convinced the king to pass a decree that will annihilate all the Jews in Persia. When he learned that, Mordecai tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews. 
with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women, and many of them, when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments Garments to clothe Mordecai, so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for her tuck, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend to her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was this, and why was it that he was behaving the way he was behaving. Hatak went to Mordecai in the open square in the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her the command that she must go to the king and beg for his favor and plead for them on behalf of the people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to the kid, to, to, uh, uh, sorry, let me take that again. Then Esther spoke to her tuck and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called there, but there is only but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds up the golden scepter so they may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king's court in more than 30 days. And they went and told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply Esther like this. Do not think that you yourself in the king's palace will escape any more than all the other Jews will. For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, then I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. <laughs> this book is totally amazing. This book is the book of coincidences. It's a book of what appears to have been cleverly orchestrated by men, but there is an amazing hand of God in the background. It is people placed at certain places at exactly the time they should be placed. It's about a king getting a dream in the night at the exact time that, Mo that Haman was marching in the corridors and at the same time that he wanted to execute this person. It's written in such an amazing way that you would wonder how people can be placed where they are placed at exactly where they should be. Let me tell you a little funny story. There was a guy who was looking for a job, desperately looking for a job. And he couldn't find a job anywhere. Couldn't find a job anywhere. And finally, he walked into a zoo, and he was hoping to be given a job either as a person who feeds the animals. He was desperate for work or to take care of the gates or something. He was told all those positions have been taken. But the zookeeper told him, maybe there's one job you can actually do. Actually, there's a position you can do, and it actually pays well. The guy said, listen, I'll do anything. I'll do anything you're asking. And he told him, one of our gorillas is sick. And we're coming to a weekend. We're coming to a weekend. And the guy told, me, you told him, you want me to be a gorilla? He said, no, we don't want to be a gorilla. We want you to wear a gorilla suit. Okay, And because we are coming to the weekend and the gorilla can't perform the antiques or just be the gorilla it is, we want you to wear a suit like a gorilla and just do gorilla things, you know, make gorilla movements and some sounds and everything else, entertain children, and we're going to pay you well. Oh, the guy thought, oh, I've never done it before, that I can do that. So he wore the gorilla suit, and unfortunately the gorilla cage actually bordered a lion's cage. But anyway... Uh, there were bars on the ceiling where, you know, you was told if you, if you can, maybe you can do a few tricks and swing there and everything else. 
And the guy thought at first it was a bit awkward because you see, him inside is a man and he can see outside that, you know, children were there playing. Finally, he wore the suit and he was there in the cage and children were coming. They were saying things to the gorilla. He was moving around, making some gorilla sounds and children were getting very excited. He saw his manager outside and the manager told him, it's working. Just, just good job. Keep doing what you're doing. As the children kept increasing and many, many of them, the guy said to get excited. He thought he can try out some of the bars, you know. He went up and took one of the bars and said to swing. The children were screaming in delight. The manager was telling him, good job, good job. The guy got excited, so he went on one of those bars. And you know how the gorillas swing like that? He started swinging. But you know the guy hadn't been to the gym in a long time, eh? He started swinging. The children were getting excited along with their parents. Then something unfortunate happened. In his excitement of swinging from side to side, when he was right there at the angle, like close to the ceiling, his hand slipped and he fell right into the lion's den, the cage. Right next to the lion and he yangukad over there. Now reality hit him. Reality hit him because <laughs> the lion stood up and came close to him. The jama went on his knees and you know now he said to speak and he said to cry. He said to say, oh please. While he was still talking, the lion spoke. <laughs> The lion told him, shut up, stop praying before we both lose our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> the lion was also stuffed, you know. This book is about being placed at the right place at the right time. You are in the right position at the right time. That was just something to entertain you a little. But where are we with this book? Where are we with the book of Esther? The events in the book of Esther occurred around 483 BC to 473 BC during the first half of the reign of King Xerxes, who chose Esther as his queen. During this time, the first remnant of the Jews who had returned to Judah was struggling to reestablish temple worship according to the law of Moses. But Esther and Mordecai, along with many other Jews, had chosen to not to go back to Judah. They seemed content to stay in Susa the capital city of Persia in which the story is set. But why is the book of Esther so important? Esther is the only book in the Bible not to mention the name of God. But that is not to say that God was absent from this book. His presence permeates much of the story as much as he was behind the scenes coordinating these coincidences. God was there and circumstances to make outcomes happen that will glorify God. Much like the book of Ruth, this book stands out as one of the most skillfully written books in the Bible. It uses eight fists to systematically build and to build a suspense. The author constructed this story with genius, using a Hebrew literary device in which events mirror each other inversely. Every listener to the story, early listener to the story, would have recognized significant events that, 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 that followed how their storytelling was told. They'd be understanding it. Haman, the king's evil second in command, was a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites, who were ancient enemies of God's people. You'll find that in Numbers chapter 24, verse 7, and 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 8. He cast a lot called Pur, in order to determine the day the Jews would be exterminated. That is in Esther chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. After that, the Feast of Purim was celebrated by the Jews to this day to commemorate how God overturned what was supposed to destroy the Jews became something for their deliverance. What I'm trying to say is this. What's the big idea? Even when God seems absent in something, God is there. There's no place in life that God is not. There is nothing that can happen to you that is devoid of God's influence in your life and mine. What's the big idea, guys? What's the big idea? While the primary purpose of the book of Esther was to relate the dramatic origins of the Feast of Purim, a greater theme shines through this story. The sovereignty and faithfulness of God permeates every single sin. Nothing is truly a coincidence. The book of Esther says that to us. God's sovereignty is best summarized in what Mordecai said to Esther. Who knows 
whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. There's someone here, you're in hot soup. There's someone here, you're puzzled. You're wondering about your situations. There's someone listening to me today and you're bewildered by the things that are happening in, in, in your life. There's somebody here, you have attained high office. You've been elected the chairman of the association of your estate. You have been elected the chairman of a committee that is in charge of a lot of people. You have just been voted into a position that runs such a big budget. Who knows that you have come to power for such a time as this. That summarizes Esther chapter 4 verse 14. It summarizes what the theme of this book is. When events seemed out of control to Esther and Mordecai, when the king dictated the ruin of their lives, when evil was poised to triumph, God was at work. And I want to encourage you. It looks like you're going to be fired. It looks like everything is against you. It looks like your heart is going to be broken. Don't give up. God is at work. God is at work. God is about to do something in your life. Even when it looked dark, these guys were out of their own country. Esther was taken to the harem. Esther chapter 2 verse 1 to 16. Their faithful obedience and their victories made God to be glorified. When it looks like the Jews were going to be destroyed in Esther chapter 7 verse 9, the message of God is clear. God is sovereign and even when it looks like God does not make sense. Does it look like God doesn't make sense to you? That's consistent with God. It's not possible to understand who God is. But God will win in the end. That's why you are listening to this message. God will win in the end. God is also the great promise keeper to Mordecai and Esther. Look at what Mordecai told his niece. If you remain silent at this time, relief will still come. <laughs> God will still bring success and you and your family will perish. If it's not you who's going to do it, God is giving you the privilege to be strong, to stand firm where you are so that you can make heaven and God proud. But if you don't do it, God will find another way to do it and you will perish anyway. That's what Mordecai was telling his niece, deliverance will still come, but you and your family will perish. Mordecai's words reflected his faith in God and would honor his eternal covenant with Abraham and David. God will still win. But I can hear somebody saying, <clears throat> Pastor Ondachi, what does that have to do with me? I don't care about politics. And even if I do, what can I really do since I am so small? What can I do? Why should I care? Let me define politics for us. Because I think that the definition of politics is lost to Kenyans because we think that politics is a person. That is our problem. Politics comes from the Greek word politico, which means affairs over cities. It's the method of rulership of a national government over state government and over local government in groups or other forms of ruling powers and relations among people, such as the distribution of resources and power. That's what politics is. Let me break it down a little. Politics is about how people get organized. That's what politics is about. Politics is about leadership. Politics is about governance. Politics is about, is concerned about how people relate to each other, how you relate to your neighbor. It's about equity. It's about fairness. Politics is about justice. It's to make sure that your rights are respected. And there are people who God calls to lead us in such a way. They're actually anointed and called by God to have a, a concern over how a city or an estate is governed. That is what politics is about. Politics is something God is interested in because everywhere where there are people, there are politics. Everywhere you find human beings, there is leadership. 
there is governance, there is equity, there is justice. There's how people are distributed, how they relate to one another. It's important that your personal rights are respected wherever you go. It's important that you, if you walk around your estate, your security is important. The concern over your rights is important. All that is politics. You cannot do without politics. Your politician, your politicians, that is one, the chairman of the estate where you live, the chief around your area, your MCA, the member of your county assembly, your member of, par of parliament, your senator, your governor, the deputy president and the president determine how fairly your taxes are used. They determine it. They determine whether your nephew who has just finished high school will get college on an equal opportunity. They determine the safety of the estate where you live. Their debates determine the priority they will give to the price of milk, to the price of bread, where you are, and their justice determines the wealth and standing of our country on the stage of the world. Their relationships determine how the rest of the world looks at us and sees us. Their debates in parliament, in and out, the decisions they make, the senators, the laws they pass, determine how people view our country. It's important that you should be interested. The wealth of a nation is determined by very many factors. Among them, its ability to, to fairly distribute resources, to encourage business, to use taxes, to invest, and have the kind of reputation that other countries can do business with us as a country. Its socioeconomic standing is determined largely by its geopolitics and the integrity in leading groups of its people towards prosperity. Politics is important. In English, our ability to tame corruption and keep away from debt determine our standing in the world. It determines it. Out of 193 countries in the whole world, I wish I had time to ask you for a quiz to guess. Which do you think are the top five most uh, wealthiest nations in the whole world? I wish we had time. I could have asked you. But let me give you uh, a snippet. The wealthiest country in the world as we speak right now, believe it or not, is not China or the United States. It's a small country called Luxembourg. Number two is Singapore. Number three is Qatar. Number four is the Republic of Ireland. Number five is Switzerland. The United States is actually number eight in the world. Out of, 140, out of 193 countries in the world, Kenya is 143. We are just 50 nations from being the poorest country in the world, which is South and Sudan. In 1963, Kenya's GDP and the GDP of Singapore were the same. In 1963, by the time we were getting independence, our GDP and the GDP of Singapore were the same. Our politics, our fairness, our debt has put us where we are, number two and number 143. Politics matters. The first five countries I've mentioned to you are quiet countries. You don't hear them making noise in the world. Much like uh, the engine of a car. When you start your car and the car is rattling and making a lot of noise, something is wrong with that engine. A country that is very noisy, makes noise all the time, you hear the politics, the campaigning, that country is actually unstable. The first five countries I've mentioned to you are quiet countries. You don't hear their politics all over the place. You know why? They have fairness in their justice system. They provide services for their people. Their city council works well and works beautifully. Their politicians understand their interests for their country. And because of that, the country is quiet. The country is quiet. Kenyans, all of us, nine o'clock, we have to be watching news. You know, if you, if you travel to any of these countries, nobody actually bothers with the politicians. Nobody bothers with them. Nobody does. Because they are doing their job. Let them just do their job. For us, we are on the news all the time. We are a noisy nation. And we need to keep quiet. As our politics mature, and as we rise up with our wealth, the country starts to quiet down. So you cannot tell me that you're not interested in politics when our country is as insecure 
as it is. What you may be saying is that maybe you're ignorant about politics. Let me begin to finish. Esther was not a politician. So if you tell me you're not interested in politics, I actually understand. She was a beauty queen who had become the king's wife. Her life became soft to the point where she started thinking like a Persian citizen. Without knowing it, the hope of a whole nation rested on her delicate shoulders. She had won the beauty pageant, but she soon forgot the bigger mission and the reason for her position. She forgot it. She needed to be reminded of the reason she had come to power. She needed to be reminded. And though trembling, she eventually did the right thing. That's why this book is so amazing. Allow me to remind us of three things that Mordecai told Esther that I need to remind us about today. Number one, here is what we want. Esther won a beauty pageant. But for us who are born again believers for such a time as this, we won salvation by grace. You are saved by grace. You won in that. Do you know that not everyone in this world will get saved? You're not get, you, you don't get saved because you cleverly chose God. God picked you out of scores and scores of people. God picked you. The Bible says that God saved us by his grace. We didn't have enough wisdom to go ahead and be able to choose God to be our God. We can't do that because when you are dead in your sin, you cannot choose. You cannot pick. It is God who comes to pick you. I need to ask you, why did God save you? For what purpose did God save me? Salvation is a privilege that not everybody will get. Just like Esther was the only person who could have been picked as a queen. You are the only person who could have been picked to be saved for what God wants you and me to do. You are the only one in that position. The hope of Kenya is Christians in politics. That's our hope. Who are you supporting who is a believer in the political arena? Who are you supporting who will determine the price of milk for you? Who are you voting for who's going to determine the street you live and its safety? If that, if that person is a born-again Christian, there is hope because then God, a Mordecai somewhere, can speak to that person. You need to understand that the book of Esther is written because of divine positioning. If Esther was not as close as she was to Queen Xerxes, those guys would have been dead. Mordecai would have been killed. Your position is divine. And you need to understand that not everybody will get saved. God saved you for a reason. And I'll tell you this for free. It was not to look pretty. You are not saved to look pretty. You are not saved to forget your position and your commission. But that takes us to point number two. We want salvation by grace. But number two, we forgot. We forgot that we are anointed for trouble. We are anointed for danger. We are anointed, like we said last week, to wear a uniform that implies we are at war. We are anointed for it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul said, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, we, we are citizens of heaven. We wear another citizenship. And this world is not our home, friends. This is a battle zone in which souls need to be saved, governments need to be governed, armies need to fight, and you are part of that army. You did not wear this uniform just to look fancy and to, do, to take photos to put on Facebook. There is a lot more to your salvation than looking pretty. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In 10 years' time, in 2032, to run for president will cost one trillion Kenya shillings. To run for president, one trillion Kenya shillings. What if we became like Mordecai and, and formed a, a church political party and raised enough money to groom a disciple today to run for president in 10 years? What would happen if the person who is an MCA, if the person who is a member of parliament, 
If a person who is an MP, if a person who is a senator or a governor has risen from our discipleship groups, what would happen? What would happen to our nation? Are you seeing the possibility of us being where countries like Singapore are, where we were together just 50 years ago? Are you seeing the idea of being deliberate about these things? Our commission is to make disciples. What if 60% of parliament and the president were discipled by us? And you know something, I'm not speaking a theory. This testimony is true of the country of South Korea. At a certain point, one church in Korea had 900,000 people. 60% of the parliament in South Korea were members of Yoido Faith Fellowship by Paul Yonggi Cho. The president could not make a decision. Parliament could not pass a decision in South Korea without consulting the senior pastor of that church. It's not impossible for us. We are prided to be a Christian nation. Number three, we need to be reminded of our mission, like Mordecai reminded Esther. Number one, we want salvation. Number two, we forgot our job. Number three, we need to be reminded of our mission. Esther, when she was given this warning by Mordecai, she said, I'm going to do what you've asked me to do, and if I perish, I perish. What a powerful statement. It's a very powerful statement. Can I remind you that Psalms 116 verse 18 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Do you know <laughs> that God says your death is precious to him? You may not know this, but the glory of signing up in an army is not to win a war. It is to die for your nation. It's to die in honor. It's to die in battle. That's the glory. People are celebrated more when they die on the front line when they win, when, than when they win a war. Why? Because signing up in the army is signing your life away. That's what it is. And when you sign up in the army of the Lord, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God takes pride because you died on the front line. I died in the front line. There's a war here to win. And the Bible says if you shrink back, God will not be pleased with you. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35. We are in a war and God wants us to be able to have bloody hands as we fight the war which God has called us to fight. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in God. The armor described for us in Ephesians chapter 6 was never designed to protect our back. Everything protects our front because we are expected to go right into battle the way that we go. Remember this as we close. If you do not do what you are supposed to do, relief will come from somewhere else. If you don't do what God has called you to do, God will find somewhere else to do it. But you and your family will still perish. That's what Mordecai said. If you do not do this, God will save our nation anyway, without you and without me. So I want to ask you as we close this series, if not you, who should it be? And if not now, when else should you fight? Say like Esther, pray for me and fast for me. And if I perish, I perish. God bless you and God bless our wonderful and lovely country of Kenya. Goodbye and God bless you.